Good morning. Hope you've had some uh, time to enjoy your breakfast and uh, mingle with your friends and new friends uh, and c- colleagues out there. Uh, yesterday we heard from a number of presenters and panelists on demographic trends, social security reform, the challenges of caring for someone with chronic illness, and new approaches to long-term care support and services. Today we're going to shift our focus slightly uh, and discuss uh, changes to health care marketplace, which is moving every day, and challenges to Medicare and Medicaid. We're also going to talk about the retirement implications of longer lifespans, and various retirement insurance products that might help you with retirement planning. And we're going to finish with strategies to maximize Social Security income, something I'm particularly interested in, as that's really rapidly approaching for me. So, once again, I'll be impersonating uh, Commissioner Kipper um, and uh, serving as the moderator for this panel. So in our first session today... We've got some experts who are going to share their knowledge with us and all of their experience on how the healthcare marketplace has changed in recent years. Uh, please help me welcome back to the panel Lee Goldberg from the National Academy of Social Insurance. And we have also a uh, new panelist, uh, Joel Slackman from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, Joe Altman from United Healthcare, and Ahmad Ahmed. Uh, from Optimum Healthcare. And one of the things I thought was great is is when you have somebody that has med as part of their name talking about healthcare, that's got to be a good thing, right? That's pretty good. Though Ahmad tells me that it's easier to remember his name if you think of Ahmad Rashad. Then you'll get it. And he's a Minnesotan, so he he likes purple and gold. So do the folks in Louisiana, though, by the way. Okay. Mr. Slackman is the Executive Director of Legislative and Regulatory Policy for the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, uh, their Office of Policy and Representation. Uh, He oversees analysis and formulation of policy on health care payment, delivery system, quality and performance measurement, health plan benefits, medical management, healthcare information technology, and all these issues as they relate to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. I bet Joel is a busy guy. Correct? What am I I doing here? Yeah, you don't don't really have time to visit with us today. Okay. Now, Mr. Altman is the Chief Actuary for United Healthcare Retiree Solutions, a United Healthcare Group business focused on the retiree medical needs of employer groups. He's responsible for product and solution development with a focus on the leading the strategic direction of United Healthcare's re- group's retiree projects, projects and products. Mr. Ahmad leads a product development team which delivers uh, telehealth solutions to the marketplace. His team has an end to end remote care management platform which uses consumer electronics, wireless health devices, and Optimum Telehealth Cloud to enable population health to over 20,000 consumers. So what I plan to do today with um, the questions, we have a number of questions we're going to be asking the panelists. Uh, We'll direct them to one or two of the panelists, but if the other panelists want to chime in with uh, their thoughts or opinions on some of these, then uh, feel free to do that. We're going to start right out with what is meant by value-based health care and what does this mean for how care is delivered and priced. Uh, Joel and Lee, would you like to take a stab at that? Start with Joel. Uh, Sure, thanks. And um, thank you again to everyone for for inviting me out here to Kansas City. Um, no, no disrespect to Alabama or North Carolina or Brooklyn, New York, but the barbecue here is really great. Um, <laughs> value-based health care, it's, um, it, it's one, one of the latest buzzwords in Washington, but what it 
what it really boils down to is moving away from the standard fee-for-service model, paying purely on the basis of volume, to paying providers, physicians, hospitals, other providers on the basis of performance. Well, what, what does that mean? The way, the way we look at it, and it's also the way that many other private payers and HHS also looks at it, so there are three parts to it. One is, and this stands to reason, you've got to change the way that providers get paid. So you've heard of ACOs, accountable care organizations, and patient-centered medical homes. And basically, there, there are different ways, and we can get into this later, there are various permutations that health plans are using. But what they, they all come down to is paying physicians on the basis of meeting certain quality or cost targets. So when a physician or a hospital or a health system does a better job of caring for people with chronic illnesses, diabetes, for example, or does a better job of holding down the cost trend, they're going to make more money, as opposed to the current fee-for-service model where the more people they see, the more time someone visits them, the more money they make. So certainly changing incentives is, is important. But there are two other aspects of value-based payment that, that we believe are equally important because changing incentives alone won't work. Necessary but not sufficient. The second is there has to be a collaboration between the payer and, and the providers where where payers are working with providers to give providers, for example, the real-time information that they need, whether it's at the point of service or for their entire population to help manage their patients better. I'll give you two, two examples where, where payers using claims data and other data can provide tools to providers. They can help providers identify the members in their practice, people who they haven't seen yet, who may be at a special risk of having a serious problem so that the provider can then reach out proactively to that person. Plans can tell providers about gaps in the care of the patient. A provider, until we get to the world where all providers are interconnected in in interoperable EHRs, which is still several years away at a, at a minimum, one thing that, that payers can do is give providers a comprehensive view of what's going on with their patients. So, you know, a, a given provider doesn't, a physician, if, if you're visiting your internist, your internist may have no idea that a few weeks later you're in the hospital. Uh, because your pulmonologist has put you in the hospital. That, that's another way that payers can work with providers to give them that comprehensive view of their, their patients. So that's the second element. The third to value-based payment is partnering with consumers. And this isn't only about, um, you know, it's kind of, when, when, when people talk about this, I think of the, you know, the, the Huck Finn story hey, this is so much fun painting this fence. Come on over and paint the fence. It's, it's really a subterfuge for consumers spending more money. And, and there's really more to it than that. Um, number one, it's, it's giving consumers tools so that they can be better shoppers, tools that tell consumers ahead of time what procedures will cost, what facilities, what providers cost more, cost less, and then what the quality is associated with that. And then also developing benefit designs that encourage people to go to better doctors. Uh, a lot of plans, for example, as part of value-based payment models, develop so-called tiered arrangements where they put into the highest tier those providers who score best on various quality measures. And people who go to those providers pay not the 20% coinsurance that might be typical, but perhaps a 10% coinsurance. So, um, you know, pardon me for, for rambling on here, but this, this 
is one of the most important movements going on in healthcare today, value-based payment. And, and again, these, the three parts, change incentives, partnering with providers, giving providers the information and the tools they need to do a better job of managing care and coordinating care and managing populations, and then empowering consumers. So Joel, uh, is that available here in the Kansas City area with the Kansas City Blue Cross? Uh, absolutely it is, yeah. Uh, Kansas City, um, I, I believe Kansas City has been piloting and or has long piloted and, and has now inaugurated uh, patient-centered medical homes. <clears throat> uh, Kansas City is, <coughs> excuse me, um, is, is also looking at a, a way of or is on a glide path to, ch to changing the way that it pays primary care physicians to encourage better coordination. And that's just one other point I want to make because what Kansas City Blue Cross is doing is I think uh, indicative of what many health plans are doing, what they've realized. Uh, providers are at different places in their readiness to accept all of these changes and their readiness to accept new payments in their readiness to accept help from payers and so on, in their ability to. And what, what we've learned is that, um, number one, as, as payers, you have to be cognizant of the varying ability of providers. So one size does not fit all. And I believe you'll see this in Kansas City as well as other places in the country where the plan doesn't say all at once, okay, everybody, we are now moving you all to this new payment system because they know that's going to crash and burn. But the second is it takes time. Chief financial officers and plans don't like to hear this, but when you make a change, it takes more than a year. I guess legislators don't like to hear this either. It, it takes more than a year to get results. And, and many of our plans have actually started moving away from one or two year contracts with payers into three, four, five year contracts because we, we understand that moving to value based payment and, and all the things that I just talked about is, is going to take time. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there. I can get to more details later on. Okay, Lee, uh, some follow-up comments? Yeah, just a, a few. So I think Joel, Joel has laid out a really good explanation for um, the shift to value from a plan perspective. And in a lot of regions, and healthcare markets really are very, very local, very regional. And in a lot of places, the, the plans are really driving that process. And then there's other places where providers are driving that process. And you see, you know, the creation of large health systems, uh, integrated delivery network systems, where there are, there are hospitals that have uh, post-acute care. They may even have their own uh, health insurance plan as part of their system. Um, and they also are driving the same kind of shift uh, to, to value. And, and then aside from the private sector, uh, there's also a public sector effort to do this. HHS has recently announced um, their, their uh, very clear goal to move a majority of, of Medicare um, uh, interactions to volume to value based care over the next several years and, and that's going to be a real culture shift um, and so we'll see how it goes it's good that both the private sector and the public sector are moving there at the same time I think one of the things that's uh, going to be a challenge is just the inertia of a lot of a lot of patients um, a lot of consumers I mean I it, certainly in Medicare um, where again sort of to anecdotes aren't good but you know my mother complains about her her cardiologist not being responsive and I suggest to her well you know maybe you should uh, uh, go to maybe you should think about a, a, a managed care plan where you know that's an integrated system and you know you, you don't have that same issue she goes oh but but I like him you know so people people may not like the doctor or they may have complaints but they they, they like the doctor they're familiar with and a lot of times um, you know the question is going to be uh, if you, does your doctor move into one of these systems? If not, you know, what kind of choices do you have? So um, I think that's, that's one of the big challenges coming forward. And the other thing is just savings from, in terms of the public sector effort. Um, 
uh, Joel mentioned uh, uh, patient-centered medical homes and ACOs, and that's, those are the platforms that you're seeing uh, this shift in the public sector. And um, the results are, you know, not yet in fully, but the initial results on ACOs have shown that there has been some increase in quality, and that's important, and, and, but the savings have really been pretty meager. Um, I mean, to a layman, uh, uh, when you hear a savings of, of $200 million, that sounds like a lot, but in the context of Medicare spending, that's sort of budget dust. Um, but still, there's some positive savings, but it's been fairly meager, and we'll sort of see uh, how that develops over time, whether that can increase at all or not. Well, $200 million does sound like a lot. Um, Joel? <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, actually, could, could somebody bring some water up here? Uh, pitcher water would be nice. Um, on, on the savings issue, one, one of the leading efforts in, in the blue system, actually in the country, in developing, thank you, uh, value-based payment is something called the alternative quality contract. Uh, you, you may have heard of it. HHS has actually modeled some of its reforms on it. The alternative quality contract <clears throat> started four years ago, and it's it's basically um, this is only for Massachusetts HMO products, and and what what the plan has done is first it it sets a trend, it de it develops a, a benchmark that's lower than the current medical CPI, and it then has about 30 or so quality measures. So if a medical group, if their spending is below the benchmark and they meet or exceed the quality measures, then they share in some of the savings. But if they fall short, they, there's a downside risk. They, they, they eat some of the cost. And this has been studied by Harvard researchers, and their results have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And if anyone's interested, I, it, I, I could provide references after. But here, here's the, the interesting, interesting point. In the first year or two, there were very modest savings. Quality actually improved, but savings were in the order of about 1% to 2%. Now, Again, that sounds small, but if you're an actuary, you know, bending the cost curve by 1% to 2%, if that continues ad infinitum, that's a pretty big deal. And what was happening was, was primarily changes in referral patterns, that physicians started sending people for, who needed MRIs not to the Brigham and Women's, which was charging, you know, a lot, but to Beth Israel, which was charging less. These researchers have been looking over the last couple of years. They recently published the fourth year of results, which now show that cost savings relative to what costs would otherwise have been are now in the order of around 10 percent. So over a period of four years, physicians have at least subject to these incentives and receiving information, cost information, quality information from the plan have begun changing not only their referral patterns, but also the way, the basic way they practice medicine. So there's at least one example out there of some pretty substantial savings, at least in an HMO environment. And Massachusetts, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, just this year is expanding the alternative quality contract to PPOs, which is the challenge that Medicare faces in fee-for-service. Can something, can a model like this truly work? Uh, thanks for those comments, Joel. Um, pretty interesting stuff. It's, this, there's been a lot of innovation over time. I, I remember when I started in my career, I had a major medical policy. And then in the 70s, they came up with the concept of health maintenance organizations. Uh, and originally they thought they'd be sort of storefront operations where all the doctors and the specialists and the nurses and all got together in what looked like a health care supermarket. Uh, that worked for a while, uh, but not for everybody. Uh, and then you saw uh, PPOs develop after that. 
and now we've evolved into many more models. Um, we've got th the last three decades where we're concentrating on horizontal and vertical changes in the healthcare delivery systems. So, Lee, you want to comment on the trends in the, that drove these changes? Sure. Yeah, and, and sure. And there's been a lot of, of, of mergers. You know, uh, there's been there was a report we put out at the National Academy recently um, on pricing power in healthcare markets, and a lot of that is uh, tied into the mergers and acquisitions. There's been a 40 percent increase in hospital mergers over the last decade. Um, and when you look at most of the, the metropolitan markets, um, they are what, what the Department of Justice would consider highly concentrated markets now. Um, so what dri what's driven this? I think there's a couple reasons. One is uh, sort of historically, if you look back uh, at the 90s, there was a recession. There was the failure of health care reform. Uh, employers started going into managed care um, and hospitals and, re and, and really driving harder bargains with providers. Uh, because they could threaten to exclude them from, from networks. Um, and in response, uh, hospitals, and, and it, uh, there were a lot of mergers and acquisitions. That was one way to, to sort of strengthen their bargaining position. Um, now, there was a backlash against managed care. Providers are, are you know, more concerned now about sort of must-have providers and having them in their network, but you still see a concentrated industry uh, as a result. Um, I think there's also idealistic reasons uh, uh, or, or sort of uh, altruistic policy goals. Um, you know, as we talked before about, about this integration and coordination efforts, uh, that's really designed to improve the quality of care and outcomes um, and, and really sort of help health systems address population health as opposed to sort of the traditional fee-for-service model. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of studies out there that show that the, the, the more volume you do in a particular procedure, you're likely to get better outcomes. And so one way of achieving that is by increasing the size of your, your health system. Um, you know, I think there's also strategic reasons, right? If you're in a market and, say, two or three of your hospital competitors have uh, merged, you don't want to necessarily be the only person left as a sort of freestanding independent hospital. Um, and so a lot of it's been defensive and, and an effort to protect market share. Um, uh, as well as the fact that when you sort of um, factor in the fact that, that Medicare margins have been pretty stagnant, Medicaid reimbursement has never been good, um, I, you know, there's an effort to increase the private patient, uh, uh, private payer uh, revenue stream and mergers and, and efforts to sort of compete on uh, the aesthetics of a hospital and sort of the amenities is all part of that. Um, and then the interesting thing, too, is, you know, you see this not just hospitals, but uh, with physician groups. Now hospitals are buying up physician groups uh, as part of a way to uh, solidify their referral base. Um, and from a physician perspective, you know, it's a way to sort of um, hand over the cost and complexity of not just a practice but dealing with electronic health records and, and health IT over to a bigger entity that may have more expertise on that. Uh, so, you know, that you see it all through the health system. Okay, what are uh, some of the implications of the current move towards horizontal and vertical integration? Uh, Joel? <clears throat> Um, let, let me talk a little bit about the vertical integration. I, you know, this, this cuts both ways. With, with the move to value-based models, as, as Lee just said, there, there is an advantage to providers coming together, not necessarily consolidating, but, but working more closely together. In Maryland, for example, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield pioneered this idea of creating virtual panels where physicians, small physician practices, didn't actually have to merge, but they act as if they are working together as, as in, in, in these in virtual panels. But let me get back to your question. What, what we're finding is um, that vertical integration, the increasing buy-up of physician practices by hospitals, is having a very pernicious effect on price. And, and there, there are two ways this is happening. First, there's a phenomenon of when 
a visit or a procedure occur, moves from an office to a hospital outpatient department, reimbursement goes up. MedPAC reported back in 2012 that Medicare pays approximately 80% more for visits when they occur in a hospital outpatient department than in a physician office. So simply by virtue of a hospital buying a physician practice, if last week you visited that physician, that, that visit may cost $100, but next week you visit that same physician who now belongs to the hospital, and the hospital is billing that as a hospital outpatient visit, and that visit may be $200. I'm just making up numbers, but this gives you a sense of, of how large. In, in Pennsylvania, High Mark Blue Cross Blue Shield w became so frustrated with this phenomenon, especially in oncology, where they started to see claims coming in for patients who were formerly receiving drugs that were costing about $10,000 a month. And all of a sudden, they saw this bump up to the very same patients, and their costs were $32,000 a month. And the increase was entirely an artifact of oncology practices being bought up by other health systems, and in this case, UPMC. So that, that's one major effect of, of integration, vertical integration. But the other is a, is a broader one, that when a hospital buys up a critical enough mass of physician practices, it really puts health pl plans over the barrel in negotiations. I mean, you, you know, when 80% of an area's cardiologists or, or pulmonologists or endocrinologists, whatever, are part of a hospital, that a health plan can't really negotiate on a level playing field with that hospital. And we, we, we commissioned a study by Northwestern University that they published through their Institute of Policy Research a little less than a year ago that using claims data from an, a number of states were able to track the extent of vertical integration in different markets and what the implications were. And what they found was that in, in areas where hospitals were buying up more physician practices and you compare those with other areas, on average, prices were 14% higher. Of that 14% increase, about 25% was the result of what I was just talking about, that just from this change in setting, price goes up. But the other three quarters was likely the result of a, a stronger ability for providers to negotiate, or to put it another way, less leverage for plans to negotiate on behalf of of buyers, and there was no discernible improvement in quality. So, you know, pr pricing is, fr from a plan perspective and ultimately a consumer perspective, and, and, and certainly your, your concern because this all f flows through into rates and is a, a major driver of increases in premiums is probably one of the more concerning implications of, of the increasing integration. And I'll just end, you, you may know this statistic, but more than 50% of physicians in, in the U.S. now, I think this is rightly, yeah. are, are no longer independent. They're, they're, they're owned by or somehow affiliated with, with hospitals. And, and, then an, and an even higher percentage aren't actually owned by hospitals, but for all intents and purposes, because of things like group purchasing arrangements, they're locked into one hospital. Yeah. yeah. You know, so uh, one of the things 